did have a question though, in, when you were sharing about reflection, because I think I get um, confused sometimes about reflection in that I um, I kind of take it on because you know I'm sort of through all the different spiritual teachings. It's life is a mirror, life is a mirror of your consciousness. But I somehow I use that to kind of be mean to myself, like um, blame myself for what's happening. It's, it's very egoic, ultimately, because I take responsibility. I sort of say, ah, this is me, this is a reflection of me, and I, this is my issue. And, you know, even when he was saying those things to me and saying, like, you know, I, I just don't feel like I can talk to you every day, and whatever, I just immediately was like this blame, me turning it on myself. And even I had felt that as well. Like, we don't need to talk every day. You know, we just, we just kind of were at that time. But it was taking the specific out of it. It's it just that reflection. I get confused sometimes about that. Can you speak? Does that make sense? Can yeah, you speak yeah, to that at all? Yeah. It's just, it's like just coming one giant step back from the interpersonal drama. Like, like when you hear psychiatrists and psychologists and counselors talking, you know, you're projecting on your husband, you're projecting on your wife, she's depressed, you're angry, blah, 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 blah. It's all describing the problem, mm -hmm. uh, but where's the solution in that? And so we grow up, I mean, I took years of, of, of psychology and, and, and it's all described as, as interpersonal, even going to a healer, thinking that the healer's a person. Right. John of God, or something, going to a body in Brazil or something, and, and still thinking that there's a body that even has healing abilities, or, or advanced healing abilities, and lots of witnesses of that. It's still all, even the healing is described in interpersonal ways, because it's, that's the addiction of the mind. It sees through a darkened glass, like the Bible says, sees through a darkened glass, it sees everything through this dark interpersonal filter. But, when that little voice starts to look at you, and you're just doing this to yourself again, you're projecting this and, and this and this and this, the I is the personality self, the Emily, and then all the characters and scenes and scenarios and witnesses outside of the Emily is seen to be the environment, mm -hmm. as if Emily is projecting. That's what the psychologists and psychiatrists say, persons project. No, the persons, the mat, persona, the mask is part of the projection too. It gets laughable when you get back far enough mm. and you go, oh, this person, I was putting it all onto this person as if they were doing this, but they're not doing anything. Persons seem to act, they don't. I mean, it's kind of like animation, you know, Walt Disney one day decides to draw a mouse. He just draws a static mouse. And then he draws another mouse, and another mouse, and, he, and then, you know, the, the little cards. Mm -hmm. You know, it actually gives us the illusion of motion, like Mickey Mouse is actually moving. That's what motion pictures were about, you know, all these repeated symbols that look like they're actually mo moving. And before you know it, it goes from a drawing of a mouse to a mouse that's alive, actually animated. It takes on motion. And it's the same with human beings. It's like we think of ourselves and we think of the people around us as these living organisms. Amazing, wondrous things, the human body and these amazing organisms. But, but it's all reflecting consciousness and then beyond the idea of it's reflecting, it's more that, that the thoughts I think I think and the images I think I see are actually the same. I've got a, a linear time image problem, where I'm generating a whole world of unreality based on one tiny man idea that Nikita talked about, that I could separate from my source. And, and until I can actually open up and train my mind to see that there's no difference between the thoughts I think I think and the world I think I see, that people aren't really people, people are thoughts, and these thoughts are of incompletion. You know, why would I look for, to seek after someone to complete me, like the Cinderella, with the Prince Charming, unless I believed I was lacking, 
a lacking thought, needing another lacking thought, and like John Bradshaw, the famous family therapist said, um, the ego teaches us one half plus one half equals one. Find your soulmate, find your love, your partner, your true love, whatever, your notebook love that dies with you in the bed, something. You know, you find that and then you get one. But he said it's actually not a plus sign, it's actually a multiplication sign. One half times one half equals one fourth. You feel codependently like a fourth when you go with that equation. You know, you feel, uh, how can I feel so? Is people, I hear people say, I felt better about myself than when I got in a relationship. Yeah. That's why I'm not going to ever have a man or a woman again. I'm going to have a cat yeah. or a dog. Yeah. I'm not going to ever go with a human out again. Because they've been through the multiplication so many times that there's the incredible shrinking man or woman, you know, feel little, totally unworthy. And then you start to finally start to say, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this equation, and that it is a multiplication, but it's one times one equals one. Wholeness looks upon itself, and that's where the good news happens. Then the mirror ends. The, then the world, the mirror is only there in perception to bring you to an experience of wholeness, to a unified perception where you, you go, I am it. I am the holy child of God, and there's only one of us here, and there's only been one of us here, and this trick of perception to think that there could be all these little parts out there, seven billion little parts, trying to find each other, and all these stories, and Cinderella stories, and Snow White stories, and all of our, our fairy tales and everything, that was all the much to do about nothing. That, that was, was seeking to try to find the love in all the wrong faces, too many places, like the country song had it right. <laughs> but we didn't, we didn't get it. And, and we even beat ourselves up with this idea that we personally were, were projecting these partners, and personally projecting this world, and that's another trick. That's been my favorite trick lately. Beat yourself up, huh? Yeah, yeah, and just, you know, the more that I will have moments where I'm not in that, then when I am, it's just very difficult to accept. You know, when I was suffering so much all weekend, it was just very difficult. I was very embarrassed, I was ashamed, um, because, you know, I, I feel these moments of what you're talking about, where the sham is up a bit, but, but then, but then not. <laughs> the male part. Yeah. <laughs> matter because the mirror is just like, oh yeah, that's me, but it's actually not even me, but it, I don't know how to say that, but you know what I'm saying, it's like, it's fine, all the mirrors are fine, yeah, thank you, that's really helpful, <laughs> what a ride, <laughs> uh, it reminds me of like, Katy Perry's video, Wide Awake, where, you know, at the end, you know, she goes through with her, her little inner child or inner girl, but, when she comes and the Prince Charming finally comes, she, she hits him. Oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> she hits him and knocks him into the bushes. He finally, Prince Charming finally appears at the end of the video and she, she hits him. It's like, oh no, I am not all over that one anymore. That's quite a beautiful thing of letting it go. Of like, no, I'm not going to be fooled. And then, what's the alternative? Well, if you're in your your joy, your expression and everything, then you seem to, while there's still the witnesses, you'll go call forth in the mirror the witnesses of, of love, of happiness. But it's so expanded, that's what we're calling this tour, we're doing a tour around the United States calling it quantum love. Because mm. it's not Newtonian, it's, it's quantum. Uh, but, but it's not, it's, what is it, it's not romantic? It's bigger than the beyond, two of us. Beyond romantic. It's beyond romantic. It's bigger than the two of us. You know, those are the lines mm -hmm. in it. It's opening to that vastness. And to feel that vastness, and then to see that vastness just witnessed to you in so many directions, it's so like, yes! Like, this is it. This, this is the, this is like the Holy Grail. This is the, what was sought after. Mm -hmm. 
and nothing is pushed away then, you know, you don't try to label anything in form as the problem or anything in form that needs to be avoided because you're into all-inclusive love. You're into not judging anything. That's what projection really is, is the attempt to get rid of something that you do not want. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we have love, we are love, we don't want to get rid of love and the projection ceases. You know, we, we, don't, we don't see the world as apart from our mind. That's the final awareness, that the world is in me. Christian Murray said, I am the world, the world is me. There's no sense of separation. Talk about the end of gossip. Oh, yeah. That's the end of gossip. I am the world, the world is me. You know, you've got nothing to gossip about. You can really be quiet in the truest still sense without, you know, trying to uh, talk about the latest news. I love that I, I never have to catch up with anyone anymore, you know, it's like an instantaneous knowing and recognition, so there's not a sense of where have you been, what have you been up doing, or even when people ask me, they'll say about a friend that I had 10 or 15, 20 years ago, how are they? I say, without hesitation, I said, they're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen them recently? No. Well, how do you know they're wonderful? <laughs> I'm wonderful, so they're wonderful, because they're in me. Mm. To see how that would be the end of guilt around family. When did you visit your mother last? Mm -hmm. When did you see your child? When did you do this? When did you do that? Those questions don't have meaning. Those are, those are irrelevant because, because our presence, our heart, our love is, is how we look upon the world. And, and it's, it's as simple as acknowledging and totally being willing to embrace and accept that love, not to play little, play small hide in these little, little person games. Not to take anything personally, good or bad. That's the, the pride is trying to take it good, you know. Yeah. I've accomplished this, and I've achieved this, and I have special at this, I have you know, special skills, you are, you are special. No, mm -hmm. it's not really, really true, you know. We're, if we're one, we can't be special. <laughs> we can't be special at this, or, or the flip side, we can't be flawed. Happily. <laughs> it can't be flawed or special, you know. Yeah. It's what a good. relief. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I see it's, it's like a, an over-eagerness to be personally responsible, <laughs> even for our own mind. Like, mm -hmm. If the one responsibility is accepting the atonement, and I prayed, it was really going into prayer about that at one point, like, then why, if there's one responsibility to accept the atonement, and then basically that's done, then that's completely accepted, whatever that means, I was praying on, <laughs> whatever that means, then it's done, like, awakening is complete, then why is that so scary? And the resistance to that, like, what is happening with the I just went into prayer and responsibility and just saw how like addicted the mind is to take responsibility for everything else. So many other things in the world and realizing that that's all a distraction from the one responsibility. If mm -hmm. there's only one and I seem to have, you know, count them, <laughs> how many there are. And also was just coming to my mind around forgiveness even, or that like taking responsibility for the projection, taking responsibility for the doubt. There's something wrong. Oh, it's my fault. You know, just constantly addicted to personal responsibility, even for, for the world, for how someone else is feeling, for peace. And so what's happened for me is, and some of that direction is helpful if the mind's used to projecting and disassociating. It's like, no, pull it back. But there's, um, the pulling it back is more to take responsibility for how it serves my awakening. Mm. To take responsibility for what is this, what can I see in this? Mm -hmm. you know, where, what is the gift for me to help free my mind from whatever it seems to be getting hooked on? 
or disturbed by. And um, yeah, giving that over. So it doesn't just stop with a self. If you come back to here and you stop here without going back, <laughs> way back, way back, then it's, it, it's just all short. Yeah. And, and people have said, you know, where do you perceive yourself? Do you perceive yourself existing kind of like in between your ears, behind your eyes, as, as located in your head? Some people feel it's more lower, it's more like in their heart, like, the, like who they are is in somehow in their chest or something. Still, it's within the body. It's like pulling everything back to a body, as if everything emanates from the body. And then this mind that made up all the bodies and that is just pure awareness is so far back. You almost could get the visual of like shh, this guy going much further back. And that's so important. So that game could be up. You know, you can think of that metaphor any time you start to. To have that, I do this all the time. Mm -hmm. Here I go again. You know, whatever that the little self-talk is, mm -hmm. critical, condemning, really a harsh little rasping voice. You know, it's it doesn't mean us well. It's it's so wants us to stay, stop right here. That this is all that there is, and that there's nothing, nothing more, and it's just not the truth. Because we're not responsible for the error. That we're not responsible for the error. We're responsible only for the correction. So it's any time it's seen, it's like, oh good, my opportunity <laughs> for correction, to let it go. You know, it's, it's like a trick of the ego to just say, oh no, it's, you're seeing it so you're doing something wrong. Or you're seeing it so it's your fault somehow. You know, you're, you're responsible for it. And it's so helpful to just like shift it from I you know, to beliefs. It's like this is what's being seen. You know, this is the belief. This is these are the thoughts arising. And it's really not personal. It's just mind. It's like mind is healing. The ego is not personal either. It's like the ego is the belief system that is being exposed. Thank God is actually being seen and being exposed. And it's not comfortable or pretty or attractive, but it's being, thank God, like this is really what we've called for, is we want the healing. So. Yes, it's interesting, you can just snip the positive and the negative, like a lot of times people will talk about God and Spirit, and they'll talk about Gandhi and Mother Teresa and, and Muhammad and Jesus and this and this, but, but you can't even find it if you go into the characters. Characters, some of the characters' behaviors were so lofty as the world would judge it that people just start getting a buzz, a high feeling being around Mother Teresa or watching Gandhi, just watching the movie. And yet, you know, there was an Indian saint, uh, Meher Baba, who was so happy and so still, had a big handlebar mustache. And I remember one story with Meher is that. The devotees were always around him. They loved being around his body, they just because he, he didn't even speak. He, he didn't speak for decades. He, would, he didn't speak for decades, and then he started using like, you know, the Ouija boards, a little spelling board, and spelling the words out. One, he imagines it, everyone's around. You know, they're happy to be around him. He doesn't speak, he just spells very slowly. Talk about the first <laughs> spelling. Is is what? <laughs> but anyway, one story was they, they they were so happy to take him out like on a, a trip with them. So they got him and they put him on the train and they went out and they were just going to go out, have a picnic or a party with him somewhere and everything. And they got to the place and they were doing everything and they, they lost him. They lost the guru. They lost. They were like, Did, where 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 is he? Oh my God! You know, they finally get him out of the ashram and they lost him. And they, they just were distraught, they thought, you know, it's not worse than losing a wedding ring, it's just losing your guru. And nobody was paying attention, and, and he was around. And then they were coming back on the train just so sad, because they'd gone out with their guru and they lost the guru. And, 
And there was another train passing and they saw him smiling on the other train with his mustache going the other way. He was just so detached from everything that, that he was just like playing with it. Like, I'm not a body. You know, don't think you can lose me. I'm still here. And then they would follow him around and, and he would be on the move and when he would stop, they would be so happy that they could build an ashram around him when he would stop because they wanted comforts and conveniences of the world. They didn't want to always be on the move following him. So they built this whole ashram around him. And once they would get to the very end, the final paint, the finishing touches on the ashram, he was gone. And then they'd look at the ashram, they'd look at him, oh, it was a choice between the static comforts of the world, shelter, all the things that humans believe is so important, and the happy one. And they would just, there was many ashrams, vacant ashrams, you know, we talk about buildings here in Brooklyn, 28 people living together, imagine finding these ashrams vacant, <laughs> because the master had walked out. Always teaching, it's fluid, it's, it's always, love is extending, it's not static. You don't ever have an object of love, you never have an object of your love, because as soon as you objectify it, it's not it. Just not it. It's a good one to remember when your boyfriend says, I have some doubts about the relationship. Oh, you are not the object of my affection. <laughs> you are helping me. 